we, we hear this term a lot, but a lot of times, what is it about? Is it about opposites? Is it about two parts to one whole? The, the origins of dualism or duality um, have begin with opposites. And, and now it's become diluted to mean two parts that belong in one uh, a whole, to one whole. But generally when we think of dualism, we think of it in, in very broad terms, like in a way of yin and yang, very understandable, or you know, black and white. But when dualism or duality begins to, uh, begin to look at in very general terms, we begin to run into some difficulties. Sometimes what are called du uh, dualities are, are, aren't really dualities. A perfect example is the one of East and West. You guys are familiar with the East and West dichotomy, the East and West divide, how the West always leads the East and how you know, we're always following. Does that bother you or is it quite an accurate representation you feel? It bothers you. But it's kind of accurate, right? No, it's not. I'll explain why. It's all about where you draw the middle line. In this slide of the earth, which you know, we're all quite familiar with, you draw the, the center line kind of like right there. And you know, it divides the world into two, so everything that falls on the right hand side becomes the east. You know where the axis of evil is, it's all dark and gloomy, it's all kind of backwards, so let's just paint that in smoke. And everything that's on the west is where, you know, the light shines. But that's not true, is it? Because we forgot all about South America. Is that east or west? We forgot about Africa. That's kind of like two-thirds of it is in the west and a little bit of it in the east. And what about Australia and New Zealand? And then we also forgot about Cuba. So really, you know, east and west doesn't quite work because it generalizes. And when you have something that calls itself a dichotomy or a duality which just generalizes, you end up with bullshit. The perfect example, if we go back to the, if I were to grab, if I were to grab Africa and shove it all the way over to the right, and then you draw your set, you draw your center line again, suddenly, what was formerly west became east, and you know, America, some, or all of Europe, and and you know, and, and and west becomes all of the countries that were formerly east. And, and if you just look to the east of the middle, which is the Middle East, you get most of the United States. <laughs> and that's the problem with dualities. A lot of times we use language to describe opposites when we don't really look into the specificities of what it's all about. Dualities are vital towards understanding anything. I find that, that some of the deepest, most profound explanations and, and uh, uh, philosophical uh, explanations of what life's all about hinge upon a proper understanding of what duality is all about. So, let's throw this all away. Oh, wait a minute, I forgot, sorry. What about Australia? Is that east or west? It's in the west now, but, you know? And then, of course, Alaska really belongs to the United States, but it's kind of like still in the west, even though everything else is in the Middle East of the United States. So, it's about, duality is about relevance as related to context. If you are picking the wrong context, you're not going to be relevant. Meaning, you put everything in, a, in the way the world has been seen all along, and you draw that set of line there, it's not relevant. It's all about where you decide to draw the data. So, duality and understanding of duality comes from the relevance which grows from context. Now, if we just throw aside that little duality or what would come to be called a duality from side for a while. Um, about a year ago I was invited to uh, Singapore to present a lecture at the at the uh, tropical the International Tropical Conference. And tropical conference, I thought I needed to do some research to understand what tr the tropical was, right? So okay, we've got uh, the, you've got to understand what the tropics is by first drawing the the equator. That's the equator right there, four degrees south of Singapore. Does anyone know what the tropics is about? Just as a, as a broad question. What, what, is, what are the tropics? The tropics are what sits within the tropical zone, the tropical belt, right? The tropical belt sits between the Tropic of Cancer and, oh sorry, that line divides between the North and Southern Hemisphere. And the tropics are defined by the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. Everything in between is what you call the tropics. 
And when I suddenly researched this and I looked at this diagram, I suddenly realized, my God, there's no southern hemisphere. Sure, you got a little bit of South America, you got a tip of the southernmost tip of Africa, you got a bit of Australia, you said they all came from you know England anyway. And these parts of the continents are so completely mitigated by the sea, by the coastal influence, you don't have the extremes unless you go, you know, 2,500 feet high on top of the Peruvian Alps. You don't have the kind of extremes you get in the Northern Hemisphere. So I suddenly realized that it's wrong to look at it even as a duality. There's no Northern Southern Hemisphere, there's the Northern Hemisphere and the tropics. The whole world can be defined, geographically speaking, by the Northern Hemisphere and the tropics. And this is a very important distinction because suddenly it puts a whole new slant on how different societies, different cultures, the different parts of the world developed over the decades. We're talking about millennia. We're talking about the time between the 9000 BC and 1580 AD, when human settlements started happening, when people started, for the first time in human history, moving and populating the different parts of the planet. What this diagram helps describe is that the Northern Hemisphere was all about extremes of climate, but very well defined. You could almost bet your bottom dollar that January in the Northern Hemisphere, you're going to be really cold. And it gets progressively warm, the leaves start growing again, by the time June comes down, it gets warm, you begin to love life, you know? And then, oh my God, you've got to start preparing, because if you're not ready, you're going to freeze to death when December and January comes down again. So it's deter determined by extreme order that happens in pockets of time throughout the year, but in each pocket you might have extremes of weather changes. The kind of thinking, the kind of mentality that results because of this kind of environment becomes very ordered. There's a lot of composure because you need to be prepared. You need to think very clearly about what's necessary. You need to keep all your tools very clean and sanitized because if you don't, you won't have the necessary equipment that will help you survive that hard winter. You need, to, you need to be very exact about what decisions you make, what kind of tools you use, and how those tools are actually designed to help you well survive. And lastly, even if you don't know what something is for, you follow it. Because if you don't, you will die. Now, we're not talking about the 20th century. Now, we're talking about the period, like I said, between 9000 BC to 1500 AD, right? Before your electricity and shit, right? So, it's all governed by a series of principles called composure, sanitization, exactitude, and iconization, right? I'll run through that again later on in the history. In the tropics, on the other hand, oh, sorry, and all of this results in what I call formal systems. The Northern Hemisphere has developed through a series of formal systems that help them understand their seasons and help them survive that hard winter. The tropics, on the other hand, what formal systems do we have? We have none. When it floods, you climb a tree. You get hungry, you pluck a fruit. It's the land of milk, honey, ukuleles, barbecues. You know, it's wonderful. The tropics are where you, you live. That's why Hawaii is seen as a wonderful place to retire. That's why Malaysia, had, we've got so much spontaneity that there's absolutely no real order because everything within the tropical belt is governed by moderation. We have, we have, um, we have unpredictability and uh, a violence of weather, but it's all generally moderate. It won't kill you, Simply, generally, it can't kill you simply because you either climb a tree or you crawl under a, a bush or you hide in a cave. Food's abundant all year round. So this sort of difference of formal systems and formal systems are what I believe govern how the different cultures around the world have developed. You can examine yourself in terms of all the cultures that the most profound inventions have happened usually happen in the Northern Hemisphere, whether it is, well, Mohenjo Daro and Harbani originally comes part of India, but it's actually in Pakistan, which is right there. Um, China, Europe, guns, you know, 
guns, germs, steel, United States. It's all about the formal systems that have resulted in that kind of progress that we see in industrialization and all that stuff. So we're looking at formal systems being made up of composure. You have to be very, very clear about what you do, how you organize your time, how you organize your equipment. You sanitize all that stuff that you rely on. You make sure that it's exact so that it is there when you need it. And you iconize it, meaning even if you don't know what it's for, if you're a bit stupid, you know, there's stupid people all around the world, you know, you gotta follow it. You don't follow it, you'll die, right? So what do we have? We don't have anything. So everything that we believe we have that governs our informal systems aren't actually informal systems, they're just dilutions of what the formal systems are. So everything we've, we see about the clothes we wear, about, you know, besides the sarong in Indonesia, has been governed by what we have iconized itself of formal systems which are northern hemisphere based, not western based, right? What I'd like to propose, or like what I'd like to suggest, is that we throw away that for a while, we move this, all these dilutions to one side, and we take specific context into account. Now, when we take specific context, which is what is unique to each and every country in the world, and more so in the tropics, because that's what our concern is. Why are the tropics lagging behind the Northern Hemisphere, right? We take specific context, and we understand that in relation to informal systems. Now, in the context of Malaysia, I've developed a series of dualities for these, or you might say counter proposals. In, in place of composure, there's animation. In place of standardization, there's accretion. In place of exactitude, there's accommodation. In place of iconization, there's narrative. Now, we, I'll run through these, through some examples of what these are. What these are, I won't give you by example. Maybe you, it's time you guys think of what examples you would like to attribute, because this is about you, not about me, yeah? So let's draw that line there, and let's look at composure first. Now composure, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, is about how you trap air. Because moving air is the death knell. It, moving air means you get colder during the winter. Of course, during the summer, you gotta move moving air, but even that is, when air is cooler, even in the summer in the Northern Hemisphere. So it's always governed by how you make air stop moving. Double glazing, sanitized boxes. In place of that, I'd like to suggest animation is how you make air move. For, you know, Malaysian application, yeah. The next example, sanitization. It's all about how we clean stuff. Whether it's we repay, we, we maintain stuff. We, we repaint buildings, we wash windows, we reclad a local luco bond, we, 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 we jet spray our cladding. Accretion is not about cleaning, it's about how you create a framework within which dirt can look good. So we leave that blank for you to fill in as well. Exactitude is about how everything has a certain precision about it. Everything comes from a manufacturer who tells you exactly how you should put glass next to steel with rubber, which you barely see over there. How tapware has got to have a certain something on it in order to make it feel palatable. That precision, that exactitude, even stuff you can't see, you know, behind how this gets held up. All of that is about exactitude. I like to suggest accommodation. Things don't have to be precise and can still look good. And lastly, iconization. This is a bit tough, but I'll try to explain it. It's about how in the Northern Hemisphere, one example of a culture in the Northern Hemisphere, just to you know, kick us off, the Western one, from the Renaissance, we know that the Renaissance is what uh, actually came from ancient Rome and then how that began, began to uh, influence what became the late Renaissance, which was the Baroque. Um, and then how the Baroque itself influenced with neoclassicism, that's how state capitals grew up in the United States. China has exactly its own set of, you know, iconizing a form. Uh, uh, each culture has its own sort of borrowing or, or, or learning, we, we call it learning, I just call it copying from forms that exist. And when that copying didn't work well for their purposes, because 
hey, we needed to move forward. It, it called for a complete disregard of what this was all about in defiance of history, which is iconization in its own sense. It's all about form. In place of that, I'd like to suggest, uh, oh, sorry, and, and now the modern movement was in react. Sorry, the modern movement was in reaction to that, and now this is in reaction to the modern movement. It's still about form, right? What I'd like to suggest is the power of how narrative can guide content. Now, a bit of explanation about that. Am I going past time already? What time are we at? From the 10 to 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, let me talk a little bit about narrative. And this is where I talk about another duality which is not about opposites. This is the dilute form of duality here. I like to talk about narrative in the way of air and architecture. Okay? As an example to explain what narrative is all about and iconization. Now, when we think about hair, I, you know, generally speaking, I, I don't think about men's hair. I think about women's hair. You know, hair in the way of what this tells us it's all about. And, and you know, the way you can identify a hairdressing salon is all these photographs on the outside. But the moment you go in, there are all these big things which you know you put your head into in the old days. And now it's like these chairs which line up. Every year is full of mirrors so they can see what your hair is going to look like, right? But, but none of these, it could make reference to, you know, a medical facility too, no. The thing which really characterizes a hairdressing salon are these. You see them all over the place. And you see them there because it helps you understand what you want to move on to, right? I, I want a bit of this, yeah? Maybe a bit of the bob, you know, the, the loose, you know, there are all these. And so we do that, you know, with, with hairstylists. Sometimes you're not sure what our head requires, our uh, different heads require different kind of hairdos, right? But sometimes we get ideas by looking at, right? Hairstylists. Kind of like shallow, but it's, it's important, right? We do that in architecture too. Just different books. How many of you have did this last week, you know? Wow, good idea in this book. I kind of like that idea. I think I'm going to do it in my project. <laughs> oh, that one right there. Yeah. And we mix and match. Good idea here. A bit of good idea here, yeah, you can put together, you know, dumbbell and suddenly, wow, create something new. That is iconization. You don't understand the narrative behind it, you don't understand the content of what it means, but like hairstylists, we do that too in architecture, but there's a very big difference between hairdressers and architects, right? The difference is hairdressing's all about the iconization of form. Architecture, Actually, it's also a pub that nowadays, but it doesn't have to be. It can be about the narrative of content. The worst thing is now, not only are we iconizing buildings, we're iconizing architects. <laughs> in the magazine, the most guilty of the lot, El Croqui, all of you have one copy in your library at least, right? <laughs> That's all you see. You don't even see buildings. You see advertisements, marketing, and you see architects of even the latest episodes, Lenny Kravitz and Brad Pitt, I mean, what the hell are they doing in architecture? <laughs> but that's what architecture has become. That's what design has become. It's become the worst of the things that we have adopted from the Northern Hemisphere. The iconization of form. You don't question it anymore. We just do it. Because if you don't do it, you'll die. But that's not true. Because we're living in the 20th century. You're not going to die anymore. So we've got to rethink what duality means. The last slide, I like to, the last two slides I'd like to show, talk about the duality of what work is all about and the duality of the human being behind the work. You know how it is? You know, success, fame, work. Do you want to become successful and that's why you do good work? Or do you do good work because you want to be successful? Or do you do good work and then become successful? You know, what's this all about, right? <laughs> I gave a lecture once in Jakarta, having to do with profession, and I thought that I needed to know a bit about the profession, about architects, and you know. And I, I discovered when I started Googling architects that I, I knew the faces of all the architects I hated, and I didn't know the faces of the ones that were my true heroes. I didn't know the names of any of these guys, well, a couple of them. Can you recognize any of these? <laughs> Who's that? Al Capo Valto. Al Valto. Who's that? Come on, Louis Barragan. Who's that? This one you must know. Alvaro Cesar. Who's that? Thank you. One. Who's that? 
Sigurd Lorenz, the guy who, who has had the most influence on Peter Zumthal? Sigurd Lorenz, who's that? Alberto Kalash, Lina Bobadi, Aro Saranen, um, sorry, this one I forget for now. <laughs> Dominic Perot, Enrique Morales, Tom Kundig, and that is um, that famous uh, Portuguese architect, uh, Carlos, it's the name, no, it's not Carlos Scarpa, that's Italian. <laughs> But it was shocking that I didn't recognize till I started, you know, really doing research what the architects, the work of the architects, who were my greatest heroes did. And that's what we've decided it to. We've iconized so much of what architects is about. We make architects our icons when it's the wrongest thing in the world to do because the duality of it is that you don't do work in order to be successful. You don't. And, and the crazy thing is, all it takes for you to become famous is one good project. Just one. You work your whole life doing one amazing thing and then you become famous enough. Usually, you know, for the rest of your life you do shit. And it doesn't matter because you're already famous. The best architect in the world did the best work when they were young. And the ones only who kept on pushing the envelope kept on doing good work. But you know what? Very few architects have done more than two or three great works in their entire lives. So you can't, you can't, you gotta, we gotta stop all this iconization. Because the duality of it is that you don't climb a mountain for the world to see you. You climb the mountain for you to see the world. There's a, a, a very important lecture that was given by David McCullough at, at Wellesley. And, and he said, you know, nowadays young people, or people in general actually, I shouldn't even say young, he said young, because he gave it a graduating class, right? But people in the world nowadays don't climb mountains to see the world, they climb mountains for the world to see them. And that's the duality, isn't it? The duality of you and the mountain, the duality of the mountain in the world. Are you climbing the mountain? Because every single step is important. Because every single step takes you closer to seeing what everything else is all about. Or you take those steps because that's the goal, man. And when I'm up there, man, I'm gonna Facebook that little shit. <laughs> yeah? So anyway, that's what duality is all about for me. I think it's about, you know, how we confront what's really important. And, um, and thank you very much.